Hi you guys, today I'm going to talk to you about noble gas notation, orbital notation, valence electrons, octet rule, Lewis dot structure, ions, and electronic elements. Before we begin, don't forget that you need a couple of things. You need page three of your notes, and so I have, you'll actually see three right here on the very top. It's got all these arrows in it. Make sure you print that out. You will also need a blank notebook sheet of paper. You'll need your periodic table that has all the elements on it. And then at the end, you guys will need your blank periodic table that you use for electron configuration. Okay, okay let's get started with noble gas notation. Noble gas notation is a shortcut to writing electron configurations. Let's face it, you guys, when we're writing electron configurations, when you get down to the lower energy levels and when you get into the F orbital, then the electron configurations can become fairly long. So we use noble gas notation as a shorthand way of writing electron configurations. Um, you don't, as a side note, you never use noble gas notation for elements that are coming before um, the element neon. So all these elements that are coming before neon, we do not use the noble gas notation. We only use noble gas notation for elements that are coming after the element neon. Okay, And that's only because these elements that come before it, the notation is extremely easy to write. The electron configuration is very easy. So let's get start off by writing um, our electron configuration for sodium. Okay, so remember sodium has 11 electrons. So go ahead. Okay, and on the same line, go ahead and write the electron configuration for neon. Okay, so as you can see, neon has 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. Well, notice that sodium also has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So sodium and neon have the exact same configuration at some point in their electron configuration. So we can, in an essence, you guys, we can replace the, conf the same configuration that you see in sodium with neon. So we can replace this configuration with the element neon by putting neon in a bracket and then writing the remaining electron configuration. Okay? And you only replace the configuration in any of the elements with just the noble gas. That's why it's called a noble gas notation, because you're using the noble gas elements to replace some of the electron configuration of, of the other elements. Okay, so let's do one more element. Let's do phosphorus. Phosphorus is, has 15 electrons in it. It has how many? One, two, three, so it'd be 3p3. Okay, and you can always check by adding up your electrons. So notice phosphorus again, the noble, um, noble gas that, that we're looking at as neon. It has um, up to 2p6. That's right here. So we're going to replace um, the phosphorus electron configuration with neon and then write the remaining electron configuration, 3s2, 3p3. So this is the noble gas notation for phosphorus. So what you were doing essentially is that you were looking at the element that you have and you go one up on the periodic table. So one row above and you find the noble gas that comes one, um, that comes in, that is one row above. So if we have phosphorus here, if we go one row above, the noble gas that comes is neon. So we can replace that with neon right here. And then we can continue with the remaining 
elements. In that case, the remaining elements would be 3s2 and then 3p123, 3p3. Okay, let's try it with one more. How about bromine? 35. And if bromine 35 is right here, so the noble gas that we are actually looking at for bromine is argon. I'm going to put argon in brackets. And argon's in bracket. Now we're going to continue with the all the other elements or the configuration um, that comes after argon. So this would be 4s2. We have 3d10. And then we have 4p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, p5 okay so we have 4p5 and this is the uh, um, noble gas notation we can do that for any of the elements let's try it one more how about something really crazy like uranium 92 uranium uranium is right here you guys remember uranium enters at the very last energy level that's energy level number seven so it enters right here and I'll go back to your blank periodic table. So you've got uranium right here. It enters right here. The noble gas that's right before uranium is radon. So now we're going to have radon for uran uranium. Okay. I'm going to go back to this periodic table. Well, so we have radon. And now we have 7s2. That's going to be next. So 7s2, remember we put 61, and then we have here, um, we have 5f3. So we write the remaining electron configurations for uranium. So that's the noble gas notation, which is fairly easy. Now let's talk about our orbital notations. So we're going to go back to your notes right here, and you want to go to this particular picture, and I'm going to zoom in for you guys so you can see this picture. This is a great picture um, for orbital notation. So you guys know that you have four orbitals or four sublevels, S, P, D, and F. Well, each one of these orbitals, when we put it up against an X, Y, or Z axis, um, axis they have different orientations. So if you're looking at the S orbital, when you put it up uh, against the X, Y, Z axes, it only has one orientation or one orbital. When you take the P orbital or sublevel, and when you put it up against the X, Y, Z axes, you get three different orientations, one, two, three, or three different orbitals. Um, the D happens to give you five different orientations, one, two, three, four, five, or five orbitals. And the F happens to give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different orbitals or seven, seven different orientations. Now, each one of these orbitals that we have or orientations can hold up to two electrons. That's why we say that the S orbital has a maximum of two electrons in it. The p orbital has three orientations, but each of these orientations can hold up to two electrons, so it's two, four, six. And that's why we say that the p orbital has a maximum of six electrons. The d orbital can hold up to ten electrons, two, four, six, eight, ten electrons, and the F orbital can hold up to a maximum of 14 electrons. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 electrons. Okay, so that's where we get the numbers. So when we go back to talking about orbital notation, we need to talk about um, the electrons, uh, how these electrons are in relationship to one another. So, so far we have been, whenever we wrote our electron configuration, and let me pull it down, whenever we wrote our electron configuration, we were abiding by the off-bar principle. 
because we were starting off with the lowest energy level and moving on up to the highest energy level. Basically, we were going away from the nucleus, according to the Bohr model. So our, we were moving um, to higher energy level. The lower energy level would be the ground state, and then uh, um, the higher energy levels would be moving away from the ground state. Orbital notation actually not only demonstrates the off bar principle, but it also demonstrates the Pauli exclusion principle as well as Hahn's rule. Okay, so let's get started with the Pauli um, with orbital notation. Okay, so for orbital notation, you will always use the noble gas notation for it. Now, um, for elements that come before the um, the elements that you cannot do the noble gas notation for, such as the elements that come before the element neon, you would simply use the electron configuration and um, then you would um, do your orbital notation using electron configuration. The reason why, once again, we don't use, uh, um, we don't use electron configuration um, to demonstrate orbital notation is because it gets a really messy um, when we get further down um, when we're demonstrating orbital notation. Okay, so let's uh, um, let's talk about orbital notation using uh, um, talking about sodium. So we have sodium right here. Um, when we are doing the orbital notation, according to your notes right here, the s orbital only has one orientation. So right here, when we're doing the, um, when we're looking at sodium, sodium, we are going to look at the electron configuration that is not being replaced by neon, so whatever is remaining right here. So you've got 3s1. You realize that that 3s1 only has one orientation, so we're just going to draw one line to, signif to um, indicate that it s, the s orbital only has one orientation. In this case, the s orbital only has one electron, so we are now going to draw an arrow that is spinning up. Okay. Let's go ahead and do phosphorus. Phosphorus, we've got um, we've got uh, um, the noble gas notation right here. So we've got phosphorus, and the s sublevel or the s orbital has one orientation or one orbital. So we're just going to draw one line. But look at p. The p sublevel or orbital has three orientations, has three different orientations, or it has three different orbitals. So to indicate that three orientations, we're going to draw three lines right here. One, two, three. Now the Pauli exclusion principle or the shoebox theory says that electrons will have opposite spins so that they could tolerate one another and not completely repel from one another because they're both negative charges. So right here, when we have 3s2, we're going to put our first electron is going to be spinning up, and our second electron can spin down. I like to use half arrows, and I'll zoom in right here. I like to use half arrows, you guys, only because that's a lot easier and neater to read. But if you want to use complete arrows, you are more than welcome to. It just gets really messy when you're writing all the orbital notations. For the second one, 3p3, now we've got three different lines. Well, 3p3 not only demonstrates the Pauli exclusion principle, just like 3s2 did, but now it demonstrates Hun's rule. And Hun's rule is, remember, passing out candy rule? where the electron goes into each of the orbitals, then you go back and you stack it up. So in this case, we have 3p3. We have three electrons, so each electron will enter each of the orbitals first. So we have three orbitals, and we have them all spread out in the three orbitals right here. So each of the three electrons is spinning in the same direction, but they're in just slightly different orbitals from one another, where they're not repelling one another, okay? Let's go ahead and do bromine next, okay? 
Now, for bromine, gets a little bit more messy because you've got the S. Remember, the S happens to have one orbital. So we're going to draw this. Now you've got the D orbital. So the D actually has five different orientations. Remember? There. And the D actually has five different orientations. So I'm going to draw five lines. Five lines next to D. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? And then, of course, the P has three lines. One, two, three. If ever this gets really messy, you can just write underneath it um, 4s1, 3d10, and 4p5 to indicate what you are talking about. So we're going to follow a poly exclusion principle. This is 4s2, so it's going to spin up and then going to spin down. 3d10 has 10, valence, 10 electrons in it. So we're going to follow Hund's rule first. So each electron is going to spin in the same direction, but just take a different orbital. First electron, two, three, four, five. So the first five come in, and they're each taken orbital, and they're all spinning in the same direction. That is Hund's rule. Now we're going to go back and put the five remaining electrons. So Hund's rule, we're going to go back and go back to the same orbital and we're going to incorporate poly exclusion so we're going to spin this electron using poly exclusion to spin down so this is a combination of huns and poly exclusion principle so this is six seven eight nine ten so now we've got a total of ten electrons four p five we're going to follow huns rule first one two three now we're going to go back and put the electrons in the remaining three orbitals and we're going to follow poly exclusion where they're going to spin in opposite directions so four and five okay so we have one orbital that doesn't have a spin and that's okay because the same thing happened with our sodium where we had an orbital that did not was not paired up and the same thing happened with four with phosphorus where our orbitals did not pair up and that is okay um, we can do that to um, radon once again, and radon will get a little messy. We've got, so 7s1, and then d, remember, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is 6d1, and then f, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is 5f3. Okay, we're going to go back. This is 7s2, so one electron's going to spin up, other one's going to spin down. We are following electron configuration, follows Hans' rule, remember, um, follows the off ball principle. Now we're going to go back and follow the poly exclusion principle with 61. There, are, It's only filling, spinning up, and that's okay. 5, uh, 5f3, we're going to follow Hans' rule. So. It's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this is one, two, three. Okay, so this is orbital notation. Now we can use orbital notation to talk about valence electrons, octet rule, the Lewis dot structure, and ions. It's quite simple. So what we are looking at is we are looking at the very last energy level when we talk about valence electrons of each element. So if we go back and talk about phosphorus, I'm going to zoom out for you guys. Okay, so here's phosphorus, and I'm going to rewrite it right here. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and write the orbital notation also. Okay, so I did, I wrote the electron configuration or the orbital notation for phosphorus, but I went ahead and wrote the orbital notation for neon here also. So when we talk about valence electrons, we're talking about the electrons that are in the outermost energy level.
Okay, so the electrons that are furthest away from the nucleus. So if we talk about the Bohr model for phosphorus right here, then notice that um, the electron configuration for phosphorus is 1s2, which is this first energy level. It has two electrons, 1, 2, 2s2, it has a, and 2p6. So there are two, a total of eight electrons in the second energy level. So in the second energy level, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And then in the third energy level of phosphorus, we have three, um, 3s2 and 3p6, which makes it a total of five electrons in the third energy level. So that is one, two, three, four, five. So this last energy level, which is a third energy level, has a total of one, two, three, four, five valence electrons, or five electrons. These are the outermost electrons, so these are called valence electrons, or in this case, phosphorus has five valence electrons. You can see it through using the Bohr model, or you can use it seeing electron configuration or the orbital notation. So in this orbital notation, you guys, we have two arrows to represent the electrons in 3s2 and three arrows to represent the electrons in 3p3. Let's do the same thing for a neon right here, which is a noble gas, okay? So for neon, we have the orbital notation right here, um, the Bohr model for neon. It's got 1s2, so two electrons in the first energy level, 2s2 and 2p6, that's a total of two plus six is a total of eight electrons in the second energy level. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is the last energy level. So these electrons are the valence electrons that neon has. Neon has a total of eight valence electrons. You can see this in the electron configuration for neon right here in 2s2 plus 2p6 gives you a total of eight valence electrons. The orbital notation also between the 2s2 and 2p6. Notice that the, or, that the orientation for the s orbital is completely filled with two electrons, but for the p, um, all three orientations are completely filled with electrons because each orientation can have a maximum of two. So in total, in the very last um, energy level, we have a total of two plus six, which gives us eight electrons. So neon, you cannot add any more electrons to this because there isn't any more space in the 2s2 and the 2p6. And you can't simply, and you can't take away any more electrons either because it has just enough electrons for, um, for the space that it has. So you can't add nor subtract electrons from it. That is why noble gases, which is what neon is, neon is a noble glass, is a noble gas, is very stable. It meets the octet rule, the golden rule of number eight, because the outer, um, the valence electrons or the outer um, shell, the outermost energy level or the outermost shell is completely filled. In this case, there's always room for just eight, eight electrons or eight valence electrons. So all noble gases meet the octet rule. They have eight valence electrons in their outer shell, which is the reason why they have a charge of zero, because they can't take in any more electrons, and they certainly can't take out any more electrons. So all noble gases have a charge that is equal to zero. And we say, oops, okay, so, and we say that noble gases are stable or they are inert because they have eight valence electrons and they don't need any more electrons to complete the octet. They, so their charge is zero. On the other hand, if we look at phosphorus, Phosphorus is not, does not have a complete octet. It has a total of five valence electrons in its outer shell. So in order to complete the octet for phosphorus, we would need to add now 
one, two, three. We would need to add three more electrons to it. So phosphorus happens to have five valence electrons, which you guys know about in your periodic table. But in order to, in order to complete this five valence electrons and move on over to eight valence electron, it needs to gain three electrons. So that's why phosphorus has a three minus charge because it needs to gain three more electrons to reach that octet rule. Um, let's talk about um, sodium. Sodium right here has, oh, okay. So we have sodium right here. And notice that sodium has only one, um, one valence electron in its outer shell. Sodium doesn't have a p orbital. So when you're looking at the valence electrons, you are looking at the highest energy level and you are looking for the s and p orbitals. If the p orbital is not there, then don't worry about it. As long as the s orbital is there, you are fine. So in this case for sodium, the highest energy level is 3, 3s1. So it's got one electron, um, one valence electron. So it only has one valence electron. But it needs to have eight valence electrons. So sodium has a choice. It could either try to gain seven more electrons, which is really difficult. This number seven is very, very difficult to gain. Or what sodium can do is that it can say goodbye. It can actually get rid of this one electron. It can get rid of it. And instead, now its outer shell will now have a total of eight valence electrons, 2s2 and 2p6. So let me show you a drawing of how the Bohr model would look for this for sodium. So here is the Bohr model for sodium. This is sodium, the neutral atom, where it has the, um, if you're looking at this, where it has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. Okay, so it's got 1s2, 2s2, and 3s1 is right here. When this one electron, the outer electron, leaves it now goes from a neutral sodium atom to an ion. So it loses that one electron. Now in its outermost energy level, which is energy level number two, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now it has eight valence electrons. In order to get to eight, it had to lose that one. So we say it has a plus one charge. Okay, so that's how valence electrons, the octet rule, and ions are related to one another. Don't forget, you guys, that when we talk about um, when we talk about the Lewis dot structure, we are talking about valence electrons. So in this case, the Lewis dot structure for sodium would be in its original atom. Um, sodium has one valence electron. So the sodium atom would only have one dot. Okay. Um, phosphorus, if we're talking about the Lewis dot structure for phosphorus, um, this uh, phosphorus would have a total of five valence electrons. So it's one, two, three, four, five. So phosphorus has, oh, sorry, right here. This is the Lewis dot structure for phosphorus because it has five valence electrons. So remember, and I'll redraw it for you. Got phosphorus, five valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. Okay. Um, so just going back to, um, to reiterate that valence electrons, the octet rule, the Lewis dot structure, and ions are related to one another. So let me go quickly go ahead and just show you once again for bromine. Okay, so we've got bromine here and I redrew it. Um, so we've got bromine 35. This is the noble gas notation. 
Here is your orbital notation. I just did in the previous example, you need to draw the orbital notation for 3D10 for bromine. I just didn't draw it because I wanted to explain um, valence electrons and the charges to you. Um, so when we are looking at bromine, you will look at the very last, um, the electrons that are in the outermost energy level. So that would be 4, that would be 4s2, and 4p5. So you would ignore the 3d10, okay? So you would ignore that 3d10. You, the orbital notation shows that you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 electrons. So bromine happens to have 7 valence electrons in its outermost energy level. If it wants to fill up all of these, um, all of these orbitals right here, the, two, the 4s2 is filled. But the 4p5 is not filled completely because, realize you guys, there is an empty space right here. So there is an electron that you can put in here, and this electron would be spinning down, okay? So there is that extra electron that you can put in here. And I made it dark so you can see it. So it would need, bromine would need a minus one charge to complete it and now bromine minus one would now have eight valence electrons in its outer shell okay so that's how charge and valence electrons are are related and when you do get a charge this would have a charge of minus one so this is a bromine atom this that is completely neutral and this is a bromine ion okay now let's talk about isoelectronic elements. So give me a moment. Okay, so isoelectronic elements are atoms or ions that have the exact same electron configuration. So you've got sodium right here, sodium 11. If we look at the electron configuration, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s1. Well, remember, their um, sodium is going to try to reach its octet rule so it's going to get rid of this one last electron. When it does, when it gets rid of this, it becomes sodium ion, which is a plus one charge. And now it has the electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. Well, if you look at neon right here, the element that goes right above neon. So if you have your periodic table in front of you right here, You've got sodium right here, and the element, the noble gas that comes right before neon, or right one row above it, is neon right here. If you look at the electron configuration for neon, it's 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6. Notice that neon, the, um, the element neon, and sodium ion have the exact same configuration. So sodium ion, and neon are isoelectronic elements because they have the exact same configuration. We can say the same thing is true for bromine. Um, I wrote the noble gas notation for bromine, so it's argon, and then after argon it's 4s2, 3d10, and 4p5. Well, notice that 4s2 and 4p5 are the valence electrons of bromine. That is seven electrons. So if one more electron, it's easier to add that one more electron so we can add that one more electron. It goes from a 4p5 to now 4p6. And instead of being bromine neutral atom, it is now bromine the ion, okay? So now bromine the ion has 4p6. That is the same electron, um, same configuration, electron configuration as, as krypton, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, but look, 4s2, 4s2, 3d10, 3d10, 4p6, 4p6. Let me try to zoom in so that you can see this. Okay. Okay, that's the best I can do. Um, so this is bromine right here, and this is, I'm going to write bromine ion. Okay, that's the configuration for it. So it starts all over here. So you've got um, the configuration. They are isoelectric of one another, okay? 
So this concludes my lecture for today, talking about noble gas notation, orbital notation, valence electrons, octet rule, Lewis dot structure, ions, and isoelectric elements. Thank you.